from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. The Microsoft OpenAI partnership has catalyzed a massive CapEx build-out and a run on GPUs. We know this. But to give you a sense of the scale, last quarter alone, AWS, Google, Microsoft, and Meta shelled out around $40 billion in CapEx allocated just specifically for cloud computing build-outs, much of it for GPUs and related AI infrastructure. To date, enterprise gen AI adoption has taken place as useful, but mostly chatty experiments dominated by activity in the public cloud. But just as cloud first remains hybridized, i.e. a more balanced approach between on-prem and public cloud workload placement, we believe a similar pattern will emerge with AI and more specifically what we're calling hybrid AI. Now to be clear, our data shows that public cloud growth for AI workloads is going to continue to expand at a significantly faster pace than those on-prem workloads, perhaps triple the growth rate. But data locality, data sovereignty, legal compliance and privacy concerns combined with a capable and trusted group of traditional on-prem players creates an AI workload tug of war that will allow the hybrid plays to capture their fair share of AI momentum. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis and ahead of IBM Think and Dell Technologies World, we shine a spotlight on these two firms as leading examples of hybrid AI players that we believe will benefit from the AI wave that is upon us. And of course, we'll share several survey data points to support our assertions from our friends at ETR. First, let's look at the stock performance of Dell, which has been remarkable, and IBM, which has kept pace with the tech-heavy NASDAQ in the past 12 months. If you blinked, you might have missed the run-up on Dell stock. Don't look now, but with the recent rally in the market, Dell is worth more than $100 billion and has a valuation that's over 1x revenue. It wasn't that long ago that Dell was trading at 25 cents to the revenue dollar. The company has made incredible progress, and despite revenue contraction, the firm's cash flow has been stellar. It's been beating estimates and guiding stronger, while at the same time aggressively returning cash to shareholders. That combination has been a winning hand for the company and its investors, with its stock price more than doubling in the last 12 months. This despite the fact that Dell remains largely without a substantial contribution from high margin software. Now, IBM had been outpacing the NASDAQ up until its last earnings release when it missed its revenue forecast and grew in the low single digits. It hit EPS, EPS but came in short on revenue. IBM had been consistently beating, and this, this past quarter was a disappointment to investors, but the company affirmed its free cash flow guidance of $12 billion this year and the Gen AI backlog that's over a billion dollars. So let's take a look at IBM in a historical context and share some ETR data on the subject. I recently put out a statement on LinkedIn that I haven't been this excited about IBM's prospects in more than a decade. The company's focus on hybrid cloud and hybrid AI with a strong software contribution, a quite successful acquisition of Red Hat along with several other solid acquisitions, most recently announced HashiCorp. We'll see how that plays out. And an R&D pipeline, that is much more aligned with product output makes us optimistic. The tepid outlook from IBM's consulting business is a bit of a concern for investors, but in my view, it remains one of IBM's massive advantages, especially as we'll talk about domain in domain-specific AI. But let's take a look at 10 years of survey data from ETR on IBM. This slide shows the net score granularity for IBM's entire portfolio going back to January of 2014. Now, net score, as you might recall, is a measure of spending momentum. And it, takes, it looks at and measures the percent of customers in the ETR data set. And by the way, there are 994 IBM customers in the latest survey. It takes the percent of those customers that IBM is adding as new logos. That's the lime green in this picture. The percent that are spending 6% or more, that's the forest green. The flat spenders, which is the gray, those that we're spending, we're spending is down 6% or worse, that's the pink. And then the bright red is containment or churn of the IBM platforms. You subtract the reds 
from the greens and you get net score, which is that blue line, and it nets out to 9.6%, which means on balance, only 10% of those 994 customers are spending more on IBM's platforms when you net out those that are spending less. And that, uh, that, that blue line underscores the trajectory of IBM's overall performance for the past 10 years, but its momentum from a customer spending per perspective appears to have bottomed and is trending in the right direction. Now that yellow line is called pervasion in the survey, i.e. the 994 IBM customers that responded to the survey divided by the total survey N, which is more than 1,800 respondents. So that's a big market presence for IBM, and it's a proxy for install base or you know, market presence. Look, IBM's major financial challenge, in our view, remains the pace of modernization of its portfolio. It's got a lot of legacy baggage that pushes revenue down, <clears throat> compresses that revenue, and is a headwind, and the growth portfolio isn't yet big enough to offset that, that, that headwind. Now, as the growth areas catch up, we expect substantially better customer focus here that IBM has is going to pay off for the company in the mid to long term. So to underscore that point, if you cherry pick the parts of IBM's portfolio in the ETR data set that are showing strength, the story improves dramatically. Take a look. This is the same methodology, but it isolates on Red Hat offerings, Aptio, Ergonomic, Watson X, and the net score doubles from almost 10% to 20%. Now, unfortunately, IBM can't cherry pick like we can. It has to report on its entire portfolio, and because that portfolio is so large, it'll naturally ebb and flow. But it's almost impossible to see a company of this size with such diversity firing on all cylinders at all times. So that is both a blessing and a curse for IBM in that if one part of the business is underperforming, another can pick up the slack, but the reverse is also true. By the way, if we were to add in HashiCorp, it would add 300 accounts to this story with a net score of almost 40%, which is a highly elevated figure. 40% in our view is a magic number. They're just under that, like 39%. So with that acquisition, it both fits IBM's hybrid infrastructure strategy and provides an accretive growth cog in the profit engine. So the topic here today is hybrid AI. And here's some ETR data that shows how the big spenders are rethinking their cloud workload placements. So this really is, we're talking about hybrid cloud. The N is very small, but we're, we're talking about 32 in the Fortune 100. So these are the big spenders. We use this as a pro proxy for those, those big wallets. And while the data is, is about a year old, less than a year old, but August, 2023, we have published many times data showing the percent of customers that are hybrid. It's about 86% out of the ETR sample that manage hybrid environments. So this shows a meaningfully sh meaningful shift in the out years with respect to expectations of where work will get done with expectations for public cloud dropping from 70% in 2026 to around 60% when the time of the survey. So it's worth noting that the overall survey shows the same percentage of customers, 59% in the out years and that is slightly higher than the overall survey, and that's up from around 43% today. So we don't, we don't want you to be misled. This is not a repatriation story. It's one of balance, and specifically in our view, the mission critical workloads that are running Oracle, IBM mainframe transaction processing, and core on-prem apps are still not moving aggressively to the cloud. They're largely fossilized and spending on-prem, and those will continue. So coming back to the hybrid AI generally in IBM's Gen AI story specifically, here's a picture of the company's AI capabilities as depicted by IBM itself. And I'll annotate here with some words. The bottom layer comprises core infrastructure built on open source with Red Hat, OpenShift, Enterprise Linux, and Ansible. But also we would consider, we would add in to this chart IBM Z and the company's relationship with public cloud providers as part of the core IaaS and PaaS and infrastructure story. And as you move up the stack, you get to Watson X with Watson AI, Watson Governance, Watson Data, some very capable products that are showing momentum in the market. And this chart depicts as well SDKs and APIs for Watson that can power third-party apps. But remember too that IBM has its own fairly massive SaaS portfolio 
that it has built up over the years, much of it through M&A in areas like supply chain, governance, finance, analytics, statistical analysis, business process, and so forth. All of these are going to be injected with AI. At the top of this chart are Watson co-pilots, or what IBM calls its assistants, things like coding assistants. And not shown here, but overlaying the, the entire portfolio is IBM's consulting and services business, which is, a, in our view, a unique differentiator for IBM. It really is the only firm on the planet, or at least in the U.S., with the type of R&D capabilities that IBM has combined with truly world-class services that can compete within industry, with industry expertise with the likes of Accenture and the other leading GSIs. Remember too, while IBM shed its microelectronics fabs, it still has major silicon design shops, both in AI and quantum computing, and that is part of its asset stack. So in our opinion, this will all support domain-specific models that are gonna to start to take hold in the market, which we feel will be later this year and into 2025 and beyond. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about Dell. Here's a similar look at Dell's net score or spending profile over time. We're not gonna go as far back as we did with IBM only because the EMC acquisition somewhat skews things uh, a bit. Dell is a completely different animal than IBM, although they are birds of a feather that they're going after the sort of hybrid model. But from the standpoint of its product portfolio, Dell is a product company first with services that are designed to help products is accelerate adoption of those products, but they're not a deep industry, you know, GSI experts, but they are applying expertise to help accelerate AI for customers. And you can see here the blue line, <clears throat> it bumped up during COVID because of remote work and the need for laptops. Dell's legitimate claim is they are really the most substantial and maybe one of the only end-to-end -end infrastructure technology companies from laptops to servers, to storage with a large portfolio that stretches from data centers to the cloud and all the way out to the edge. You know, Lenovo is, is in there as well. And maybe some of the Japanese suppliers, you could probably put in there, uh, but nothing to the, to the extent that Dell has. So you see the company's net score here for its portfolio overall is 20%. And again, this means that 20% of the 900 Dell customers, roughly the same as IBM's, a little smaller, in the ETR survey are spending more when you subtract out those that are spending less. And you can see the downward pressure coming out of COVID as demand for PCs wane. But you can also see the expected uptick in the survey. Remember, this is a forward-looking survey from a combination of a Windows refresh, AI PCs, AI servers, and, and an uplift in storage performance, which is expected. And Dell has similar challenges, does IBM, in terms of it's got a large legacy install base, that moderates revenue growth, but has a much less complicated portfolio than IBM does. And one that Chief Operating Officer and Vice Chairman Jeff Clark took to rationalizing many years ago after the EMC acquisition, he consolidated a number of the products. But like the IBM example we just shared, when you cherry pick the ETR data in Dell's portfolio, you get an uptick in spending momentum on Dell platforms. You can see here the net score jumps from 20% to 28%, when you do that cherry picking and the decline coming out of the isolation economy appears to have bottomed and is headed in a positive direction, again, similar to IBM's trajectory. And we'll see going forward if the trend lines hold for these two companies, but our expectation is that they will with the AI tailwind coming out of uh, NVIDIA GTC for, for Dell and a PC refresh and storage product momentum. By the way, we didn't mention this, but we see also storage momentum within IBM's base. Remember, Dell got a big stamp of approval from Jensen at GTC when he anointed Dell as the best end-to-end -end technology infrastructure player. And that, we think, should carry into AI. Now, just as a fun little aside, earlier this month, we put out a Twitter poll asking our community, is NVIDIA the Cisco of AI? Remember, Cisco was the most valuable company during the dot-com boom. Still a great company, but not, not what it used to be in terms of you know, number one in the world. Or is NVIDIA Google? Remember, that company really ascended after the dot-com blew up. Now, the consensus from the community was interesting. It was almost 50-50 split. But Crawford Del Pret, who's the CEO of IDC, actually is the president, and he should be CEO, just give him the title, I thought had the best comment when he said, the better comparison with NVIDIA 
is the Wintel duopoly with a unique hardware and software combination that changed the productivity game. The difference is that that was a virtual monopoly, Intel and Microsoft, whereas NVIDIA is a single company. Now, what does that have to do with Dell? Well, just as Michael Dell bet his company on the Wintel standard, he and Dell are betting big on NVIDIA. The big news for Dell out of NVIDIA's GTC conference was the AI factory, the Dell NVIDIA AI factory. This is a term Jensen coined, and this stack diagram shows end-to-end -end infrastructure from core to edge to cloud with compute, lots of GPUs from NVIDIA, networking, storage, PCs, and presumably Apex, that's the as-a-service, then NVIDIA's software on top. That's the AI operating system, if you will, like Microsoft's OS. Then services on top with use cases in the very top around getting your data house in order, training, inference, retrieval, augmented generation, or RAG, et cetera. Now, this is not to say that Dell is dumping Intel or AMD or Microsoft. By no means is it doing that. It's adding to its capability, but Michael Dell has cut the line, if you will, on AI and is going all in with NVIDIA. Great move in our view to leverage Dell's size, scope, and supply chain prowess to increase its relevance to customers, get closer to NVIDIA and put itself in a better, better position to get GPU uh, 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 sourcing, and use the concept, basically co-op the concept of AI factory as a marketing message that really resonates with customers. We're super curious to see how Dell positions the AI factory at Dell Tech World next week and what additional features, capabilities, and our partnerships and other details that it adds. Now, coming back to hybrid AI, let's revisit the Gen AI power law that we put out from the Cube research team uh, early last year. You may, re may remember the concept here. Uh, we set the dimensions in the graph, we took a little liberties with the notion of power law, but we said the vertical axis is size of the model and model specificity or domain specificity is on the horizontal axis. The point being that we see the big CapEx companies spending on GPUs up in the upper left, but over time and dominating, but in that large language model space, but over time, industry specific smaller models are going to be applied on prem and out to the edge. Bringing AI to the data, as the buzz phrase goes, the value prop here being control, governance, lower cost inference, lower latency, and across all these industries that we, we show here, like financial services, autos, healthcare, retail, telco, uh, et cetera. The other interesting piece of the power law that we show here is the, which is different than many power laws, is the wide availability of an innovation around third party and specifically open source models. Meta being one of the big wild cards here, but others are jumping in like Databricks with DBRX and Snowflake with Arctic. We'll see if these two have the stomach to compete in that space, that LLM space long-term. But the point is there will be pressure to apply Gen AI to the data that lives on-prem and the likes of IBM, Dell, HPE, Oracle, Cisco will be driving products and services into the hybrid AI mix. And again, we're not predicting repatriation here by, by no means. The cloud players have the capital, they have the partnerships, they have the scale, they have LLM optionality, they got the distribution channel, they got AI tooling, they have core IS and PaaS. They have some major assets, and that's going to confer strategic advantage, but the traditional legacy players have a presence as well and will compete for business. So let's take a look at some of the data in this regard from ETR. Here we show a two-dimensional view where we filtered on 823 ML and AI accounts in the latest survey of around 1,800 IT decision makers. The vertical axis, again, is net score or spending momentum. The horizontal axis shows account penetration or what we call overlap within those 823 accounts. So we're basically saying, okay, inside of these 823 accounts, which players have a big presence? So we're plotting super micro, it has only a 5% account penetration, so not super penetrated, but you know, maybe it's got some upside. HPE at a really respectable 25%, Google Cloud at 43%, Dell and IBM at 42%, Oracle at 54%, Cisco at 63%, and AWS at a whopping 73% overlap. 
Note the table insert in the upper right, that shows net score and the ends in the MLAI sector for each company. And that's how the, the dots are plotted. Now we don't show Microsoft in this slide because they are so ubiquitous and dominant. They're like in the 90% overlap range, so it skews the data. But the key points are, as we said, one, AWS and Microsoft, key public cloud players, have a very strong presence inside of the ML AI accounts within the data set today, and we think that's going to continue. Now, this is nuanced, but Google is behind those two, but other data that we've shared, when you flip this and actually show the AI products that Google is selling and compare that to what, what others are selling, specifically AWS, they're gaining ground relative to AWS with their AI products. Remember, this data represents all products, not just AI products. So, and, and its presence within the account, it's an account, customer count, it doesn't represent spending levels, okay? And the third point is the on-prem players, including IBM and Dell, they got a major presence, as you see, in leading AI customer accounts and are gonna vie for a piece of the pie. All right, let's close with what we're gonna be watching at both IBM Think and Dell Tech World. Let's go first with IBM. With the Red Hat acquisition, which was led by Arvind Krishna, IBM is all in on hybrid. And we expect this positioning to translate into hybrid AI. The mindset in cloud has shifted from cloud first, cloud only, to cloud native, yes, but more balanced, where customers really feel like they can get substantially similar experiences on-prem. So thinking, not an exact equilibrium, but definitely a more balanced approach. You hear terms like cloud smart, or of course hybrid. We expect a similar balanced mindset with hybrid AI, with the proviso that the likes of IBM and Dell and others can keep pace with LLM optionality, surrounding infrastructure, partnerships, and the like. They don't have to copy the cloud players identically, but they have to have enough innovation in their portfolio or that lower TCO argument and the FUD of privacy concerns will give way to the public cloud players who will eventually you know, figure out those, those, those other governance challenges just like they did in the early days of cloud. But the difference here is that in the early days of cloud, the on-prem guys had a very poor story. Today, the story is much better uh, because they've, they've kind of figured out the cloud or at least how to, how to, how to coexist with cloud and they are, heavily into AI. They're not waiting like they did with cloud. IBM is also all in on open, and we expect IBM to build on the momentum coming out of Red Hat Summit. In Denver, Red Hat touted RHEL AI and brought together IBM's open source license Granite LLM and Instruct Lab model, which uh, Instruct Lab, which is model alignment tools. We expect IBM to build on that, demonstrate its synergies with and contributions to the open source community. And we expect IBM, along with other hybrid AI players, to feature their plans to take customers beyond the experimental phase into substantive ROI. It's like ROI, uh, enterprises are desperately seeking ROI of AI. Again, along the power law of Gen AI curve, that's where customers are gonna get a, uh, ROI. It's the data and the, and the propriety of that data, the uniqueness of their individual data sets that are going to drive that ROI. So we'll be watching for real world examples of domain specificity. And we expect IBM to showcase some of its recent acquisitions and how they're driving customer value. Think Aptio, Turbonomic, and of course, HashiCorp, although that, ha that deal hasn't closed yet, but, and, and others that they've recently acquired. We expect them to showcase how these are driving automation and again, injecting AI into all these offerings. And finally, IBM must, in our view, continue to expand its ecosystem partnerships with cloud players and importantly, SaaS vendors and other partners where IBM can plug Watson X tooling in to its partners' portfolios. Okay, let's close on Dell Tech World. Dell, in our view, is entering a new era of relevance to customers. Its EMC acquisition and financial leverage that it gained from VMware have been one of the most remarkable transformations in the history of enterprise tech. We'd love to hear from you what you think is comparable. Maybe Oracle's transformation, maybe IBM in the early Gershner days. 
certainly Microsoft would be right up there with uh, Satya Nadella's transformation. But the, the Dell EMC combination is, uh, is a fairly astounding uh, transformation. Anyway, the AI era opens up a new chapter and in, 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 in Dell form, its founder is leading them into this new era with a very bold stake in the ground. Jensen is speaking at DTW. DTW. It's always interesting to see if he shows up in person. And Bill McDermott is part of the keynote. Hmm. ServiceNow CEO. What's that all about? Is it a partnership? Are they, is it a kind of two-way customer? Is there a big automation play there? Well, we're going to find out. Dell is going hard after the AI factory messaging. It's, it's really brilliantly co-opted that and is likely going to be touting how they are the safe and trusted bet to drive ROI and lower risk. And the end-to-end -end story of Dell's portfolio is going to be on full display. AI PCs, servers, bringing AI to the data, new storage announcements, data protection momentum around cyber resiliency, data mesh with the Starburst partnership, server-led internetworking to support AI workloads. Charlie Cowis from Broadcom is one of the keynote speakers. And they're a huge Dell partner, and they do tons of stuff in, in internetworking, in NICs, and of course, Dell services to make it all easier to do AI, to adopt RAG, and other AI innovations. And as with IBM, what's going to be critical is partnerships. Both those that are selling through Dell's channel, everybody wants to, to tap Dell's go-to-market channel, but also Dell keeping pace with the cloud players, offering LLM optionality, cloud partnerships, driving domain specificity along the Gen AI power law notion, and delivering it all as a service. It's going to be a big week for theCUBE. We'll be broadcasting from both IBM Think in Boston. Think used to be a giant event, but it's been substantially scaled back. Much more intimate now with a few thousand attendees. Dell, we expect to be bigger. In 2023, I'd estimate it was probably around 7,500 attendees. And we would expect with Dell's momentum, the event is going to be over 10,000 attendees this year. So go to thecube.net to follow all the action with myself, John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Shelley Kramer, Bob LaLiberté, the Silicon Angle journalist, and our social media team, and Rebecca Knight with Rob Strecce are going to be at Informatica World. Yeah, big week for theCUBE. Are you going to these events? If so, stop by and say hello. All right, that's it for today. Thanks to Alex Myerson and Ken Schiffman on production and on our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and in our newsletters, and Rob Hof is our editor-in-chief over at siliconangle.com. Thank you all. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn posts. And please check out etr.ai. Every time I talk to these guys, they're driving new innovations in survey data best data in the enterprise tech business, in my opinion, from a survey and demand side standpoint. Start from the customer, work backwards. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Research Insights, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.